the Lord to worship. And as you're entering this morning, we just like to ask you to just rest your heart in the Lord. Just trust in his faithfulness. Give your heart a moment to just reset and reconnect with him. Thank you, Jesus. We welcome your sweet, sweet presence in this place. And we sing and declare of your faithfulness. Let's sing that. Then sings my song.
unite our faith when we declare this. All the earth will shout his praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. Let's sing that together in one heart, in one faith. Let our praise arise, all the earth. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. All the earth, all the earth. everyone. 
We are so glad you're joining us. Whether you're with us online or in person, here are a few things you need to know. There are a lot of great things happening at Harvest Time. Here are a few ways you can get involved right now. To check out all the things that are going on, scan the QR code or visit htchurch.com. If you would like to give, you can visit us at htchurch.com. Click on Give at the top of the page or use our Realm Connect app to set up recurring giving. Or you could give anytime using the Harvest Time offering envelopes. We have so many opportunities to believe, belong, and be light. For more information on all things Harvest Time, meet us at the Connect Desk. We love you, Harvest Time, and have an amazing week. Good morning, everybody. God bless you. Welcome to Harvest Time. Great to see you in the Lord's house today. Didn't the team do a great job leading us to the feet of Jesus in worship? Hallelujah. It is good to worship the Lord together. Want to welcome you and also welcome everybody who's worshiping with us online this morning. It is great to be together, united as one family in the Lord. Want to remind you, our kids' ministries have returned on Sunday morning. So just if you're not sure how that schedule shakes out in the first service, we've got ministry for kids from birth through age four. And during this service, we have ministry for all of your kids up through the fifth grade. If you have little ones with you today and you're concerned that they may not be able to sit through the service quietly. We have wonderful nursery care for your infants and your toddlers in all of our services. Right about now, actually, in this service, we also have life groups for our middle school and high school students that covers grades 6 through 12. In just a few moments, the ushers are coming to wait on us for our giving, and we want to say thank you for all of your loving financial support of Harvest Time Church. Thank you for being faithful in bringing the Lord's tithe. That's the first 10% of what our Father has graciously entrusted to us during this week. Do you know that God promises his rich blessing on us when we give? He tells us in his word, the one who sows sparingly shall reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. That's a good word, amen? amen? We have the privilege of partnering with him in the work of the kingdom. That's what the word tells us, and giving is just one of the ways that we do that. There's an envelope in your program today, and you can use that envelope to give in a few different ways. You can give by a check made payable to Harvest Time Church. You can also give using a debit card or a credit card, and if you are giving that way, we just ask that you'd help us out, help out our bookkeeping staff by making sure that you provide us with all the information. If you're giving cash and you'd like to receive credit for your giving, please again make sure that we know who you are and give us all your information so that we can get you the credit that you need. You can always give online at any time. Just use our Realm app to give, or you can give through our website at htchurch.com. Very simple. There's a giving link on the top of the home page that you can use to make a one-time gift or to set up regular automatic giving. Lots of people are choosing to give that way now. Just very easy to do, easy to set up, and very secure. You can also give by text, and instructions on how to give by text are located on the screens. Couple of quick things for you just before the ushers come to wait on us. I want to remind you that our life groups are in full swing now for the fall. We have many life groups meeting on different days of the week, both here at the church and elsewhere. I think we're up to about 45 groups right now, which is awesome. And uh, you can choose from a variety of Bible studies. We've got prayer groups, we've got groups for men, groups for women, groups for young adults, groups for senior adults, groups for couples, and meeting throughout the week. Wednesday night is Family Life Night here at Harvest Time. All of our kids and teens programs are rolling at 7 p.m. Pastor Glenn is leading a course called HT Basics, which is for people who are interested in exploring the basics of the Christian faith. I'm teaching a Bible study called Encountering Jesus, where we explore how Jesus' coming was predicted by the prophets. And also on Wednesday, there are uh, two more groups for women. There's a group for men and uh, lots of other things happening. You can search for a life group on the Realm app or through the website. When you go to the website, there's a life groups link on the top of the home page, and it opens up into a search box where you can search for a group that's interesting to you by the day of the week, whether it's focused on men and women and so forth. So check that out at htchurch.com. Uh, one more thing, this coming Saturday, the prayer ministry is hosting a 12-hour fast uh, a prayer meeting that's going to run from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So if you need a breakthrough in your life or if you need an answer to prayer, how many of you believe that God answers prayer? Amen. You've seen God do things for you. 
You're welcome to come for all or for any part of that meeting. Come and join us this coming Saturday. Be blessed, and let's call upon the name of the Lord together and see God move. Amen? I'm going to invite the ushers to come and wait on us now for our giving. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and invite his blessing on us and his blessing on the seed that we're about to sow into his kingdom. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in the beautiful name of Jesus. It's the name that opens heaven's door to your people. Father, we thank you that you so love the world that you sent your one and only son, Jesus. Your word says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Father, we thank you for all of your mercies. We confess together today that we are a blessed and a grateful people. Now, as we give back to you, Father, we sow in faith, Lord. We return to you our tithes. We bring you gifts for our building fund and gifts for the work of missions. Lord, would you bless your faithful people throughout the week that's ahead. Father, pray that you would multiply this seed that we're sowing now to meet the needs of your house and enable us to take the message of Jesus' love all around the world. We pray in his name. Amen and amen. God bless you as you give this morning. God bless you, everyone. We're so glad you're here. Glad you came to worship with us today. I want to welcome everybody worshiping online with us. If you have your Bible or your Bible app, turn with us to the letter of 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to finish this letter today. We've been looking at it for the last little while. And uh, we want to look at some of Paul's final words. 1 Timothy chapter 6. On your way in, you received a program, and in your program, there's an outline of the sermon. And if you like, you can listen, fill in the blanks, follow along. If you'd like to have an outline at home, there is, uh, in the chat section of the live stream, there's a, a link to a PDF. You can click on that and have an outline of today's sermon. First Timothy chapter 6, going to start reading in verse 2. Um, if you'll bear with me, I want to read you a couple of verses from chapter 3 of this letter, and then I'm going to meet you in 1st Timothy chapter 6. So you just wait for me there, 1st Timothy chapter 6. Uh, but listen, listen to these words from 1st Timothy chapter 3. Reading from 1st Timothy 3 verse 14, St. Paul writes to his spiritual son Timothy, although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing these instructions so that if I'm delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Beyond all question, great is the mystery from which godliness springs. God appeared in the flesh. He was vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, preached among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Now, let's meet in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And starting in verse 2, Paul writes to Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, verse 2, These are the things that you are to teach and insist on. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree with the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and think that godliness is a means 
to financial gain. Look at verse 11 of 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6 and reading in verse 11. But you, O man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses, in the sight of God who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 20, and we're going to finish this letter today. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20, and this is what I want to preach about. Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Look at Paul's words. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge. If you're reading in the King James Bible, it says what is falsely called science, which some have professed and in so doing have departed from the faith. Grace be with you all. I want to talk to you for a few minutes today about cut the chatter. Cut the chatter. So... My lifetime has coincided with the information age here in America and all around the world. The information age started in the latter half of the 20th century and perhaps it reached its pinnacle in 1994 when Al Gore invented the internet webs. That joke is lost on most of you, but I said it anyway. Maybe the pinnacle of the information age was the invention of the information superhighway, the internet. But with the advent of smartphones and social media and their many platforms, some have suggested that we have now entered a new age of disinformation. One thing that we can say for sure is that people worldwide are being bombarded with information at a rate never before known in human history. Did you know that 96% of Americans own a smartphone or a cell phone? When you take into account the, the very young and the elderly, that is an amazing statistic. 49% of the world's population overall own a smartphone or a cell phone. 75% of people admit to taking their smartphones to the restroom with them. Speaking of that, your cell phone has an average of 18 times more bacteria on it than the flush handle in a public restroom and all God's people said, yuck. When I read that statistic, I immediately got out the Clorox wipes and I wiped off my cell phone. Listen to this, about $2.4 billion a year is spent repairing or replacing cell phones that have fallen into the toilet. And I have my own adventure from Nepal. <laughs> Smartphone users touch their phones an average of 2,617 times a day. The average amount of time spent daily on a cell phone is four hours. Not too smart. You know, more and more studies are being conducted about smartphone addiction. Most people admit that they become anxious when they're separated from their smartphone. Young people especially suffer from what is called FOMO, fear of missing out. Another thing that we can say is that a lot of information today is being manipulated to influence people's thinkings thinking and to shape their opinions. Truth is being suppressed and fringe extremes are being spotlighted and normalized as mainstream. Actual news is being concealed and false narratives are being promoted. You know, as followers of Jesus, the quality, the quality of the information that is coming at us and the quantity of the information that's coming at us poses a challenge to our faith. It can cause us to lose our spiritual equilibrium. It can cause us to stumble in our faith. It can persuade us to pursue the wrong things and to miss the mark of the Christian life. But 
disinformation is nothing new. In the first century, the Christians in Ephesus were battling against it. St. Paul dispatched his spiritual son Timothy to Ephesus to confront those who were disseminating disinformation. This letter that we've been studying over the summer contains Paul's instructions for combating disinformation. We've come to the end of 1 Timothy, but just before we move on to Titus, I want to share about Paul's final charge to his spiritual son in this letter. Timothy, turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge. The charge to Timothy and to us is cut the chatter. For our final thoughts on 1 Timothy, I want to talk about how we can do that. How do we regulate the quantity of information that is coming at us? And how do we evaluate the quality of the information that's coming at us? How can we cut the chatter? A few thoughts from 1 Timothy. The first thought is this. Consider the source of your information. Consider the source of your information. Apostles creed or apostates greed. Let's talk about the truth for a minute. When Jesus was being tried by Pontius Pilate on the morning of Good Friday, Jesus said to Pilate, this is the reason for which I was born. For this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Jaded by a lifetime of cutthroat politics, Pilate cynically sniped back to Jesus, and what is truth? What Pilate didn't realize is that he was standing before the very embodiment of truth. In his incarnation, Jesus was, and he is, truth personified. Beloved, I want to tell you today that at the heart of the Christian faith is not a set of religious ideas. It's not a set of philosophical ideals. At the center of Christianity is not a moral code. At the center of Christianity is not an ethical system. Christianity is not founded on deep thoughts and musings and reflections. At the core of Christianity is a person. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said, I am the truth. Truth is the incarnation of Jesus. God put on a body of human flesh, stepped out of the splendor of heaven and into human time and space. God became a man and walked among us at a designated time in human history. If that is true, and it is true, what could possibly be more important than that? Truth is the sinless life. And matchless ministry of Jesus. Truth is everything Jesus said. Everything he did. Everything he taught. All of his interactions with people. Both those who were for him. And those who opposed him. Truth is Jesus' mighty miracles. The Holy Spirit verifying his divine identity. Truth is Jesus' life of constant communion and prayer with the Father. And his total surrender to the Father. I only say what I hear my Father say saying I only do what I see my father doing truth is the perfect picture of God portrayed to us by Jesus no one has seen God at any time but God the one and only Jesus who is at the father's side has made him known to us Jesus said to Philip Philip if you have seen me you have seen God the father truth is the cross of Jesus Christ where justice and mercy met together in an astonishing display for the ages. Truth is Christ's burial, his resurrection on the third day, his ascension. Truth is Jesus' return to earth to administer perfect justice and to set right every wrong. But I want to tell you that I believe the time for Jesus' return is drawing near 
Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days that the Son of Man comes again. Do you see what's being done to our little children in the name of public health and education? They're being groomed by perverts and irrevocably mutilated. Jesus said that the eternal punishment for those who harm innocent children will be a fate far worse than a violent death. I really don't believe that God can stay silent much longer. We must either have revival or it will be judgment. And if it's going to be revival, it's only going to come if we pray it in. That wasn't in my notes. That was for free. <laughs> Since Jesus is God's greatest act of self-revelation, Jesus is the ultimate truth. Jesus is the source of all truth. He's the origination point of truth. Jesus is the substance of truth. He's the warp and the woof of truth. He's the terminus of truth. Jesus is the goal of truth. Now listen, that, that doesn't mean that, that we shouldn't accumulate knowledge in, in many other subjects and disciplines. We do accumulate knowledge in many fields, but everything else we learn, we process in the light of Jesus coming and in the light of the revelation of God that we've received through him. In the light of Jesus, we understand who we are and we understand why we're here. King Solomon said this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is insight and good judgment. Do you realize that in Jesus we find all the answers to the perennial questions of mankind. How did I get here? How does the story of the earth end? Why are we here? What is the meaning of life? What is my purpose? How should I live my life? And what happens to me when this life is over? All the answers, all the answers are found in Jesus. In 1 Timothy, St. Paul says that the repository for this truth about Jesus is the church. In the city of Ephesus was the temple of the goddess Diana, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. On top of a huge foundation sat 127 columns over 60 feet high, and they supported an enormous white marble roof that glistened in the sun. People came from all over the world to see the temple of Diana. It was a sight to behold, but there never was any truth in that temple. Diana was fabricated by human hands out of marble. She had eyes that couldn't see and ears that heard nothing and a mouth that couldn't speak and hands that couldn't move. In Old Testament times, the temple of the living God was found in Jerusalem, but Jesus changed all of that. The family of God, the church of the living God is the pillar and the foundation of truth in the world. The truth about Jesus is baked into our foundation. It's embedded in our foundation. Jesus is the cornerstone and it's the teaching of the apostles and the prophets of the first century under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit enshrined in the scriptures. That is our foundation. And like a pillar, the church lifts high the truth of Jesus in the world for everyone to see. The church is the eighth wonder of the new world, pointing all people to him. But God's truth has always been challenged in the world. It's been challenged since the very beginning. Satan was the author of the first disinformation campaign way back in the garden. Did God really say? Now, nah, that's not right. Independent fact checkers have determined that to be false. You shall not surely die. 
St. Paul wrote that Satan masquerades as a messenger of light. He masquerades as a messenger of truth and knowledge. He masquerades as a messenger of scientific objectivity and veracity. He masquerades as a messenger of empowerment and enrichment. He masquerades as a messenger of wisdom and virtue for living, of sophistication and enlightenment. And his servants masquerade as messengers of rightness and they are aplenty. In 1 Timothy, we find some helpful tests for evaluating the sources of the information that's coming at us. One test is the test of motives. In 1 Timothy, Paul exposes a few motives that are driving the disinformation problem. One motive Paul exposes is control. He says they want to be teachers. They want to influence people. They want followers. They want subscribers. They want adherents. Most powerful motive is the motive of greed. Paul says they love money. Another motive in 1 Timothy is sexual perversion. Paul says they're profane and unholy. They're loaded down with sins and swayed by all kinds of evil desires. They revel in sexual perversion and they take pleasure in seducing others into it. Another test, this is a nice light sermon this morning. You like it? It's nice. It gets, we'll, we'll get there. Another test for evaluating is attitudes. In 1 Timothy, Paul calls out those disseminating false information as authoritarian, elitist, conceited, self righteous, and belligerent. You know, someone saying something outrageous like, I am science, might be a good example. Trust the science. I do trust science, but I have found that scientists are just as fallen as the rest of us. When Denise and I studied in graduate school, we were taught that there is a certain disposition of humility that is classically attached to the pursuit of knowledge. Only Jesus was qualified to make a statement like, I am the truth. None of the rest of us are qualified to say something like that. In Ephesus, among the sources of disinformation, that humility was absent, and I find that it's absent today. Beloved, listen to me. If someone has to resort to belittling their opponent, if they have to resort to ad hominem attacks, on their opponent's character and on their intelligence, it's a sure tell of their motives. One more test for evaluating the content of information uh, it, it, uh, is the content. The test is what is the content? In Ephesus, Paul says there was a lot of meaningless talk. The sources of disinformation were using a lot of words to say nothing at all. They were parsing the meaning of words with no real substance. Their talk was illogical and devoid of reason. Paul says, godless chatter mislabeled as knowledge. I like the way our friend Brian Simmons translated that verse in the Passion Translation. Empty echoes and perverted, twisted reasoning. Beloved, listen to me. In this age of disinformation, it matters where you get your information. It matters where you get your news. It matters who and what you allow to shape your thinking and form your opinions. It matters what influences your morals and your values. It matters what forms your worldview. It matters what you watch on television and what you see at the movies. It matters what you read in books and magazines. It matters what you scroll for four hours a day on social media. It matters what music you listen to, what video games you play. It matters because your mind is meditating on all of these things and it is forming Forming you and shaping you. Uh, apply these tests to, let's say, social media influencers. What are their motives? Do they stand to make a profit 
by engaging you and by holding your attention. You know, even, even a small potatoes social media influencer has a relatively few number of followers can earn between fifty and hundred thousand dollars a year. And what is their content? Godless chatter. Apply these tests to media companies and their many platforms. Apply these tests to politicians and pundits, to our social institutions, both public and private. What are their motives? What are their attitudes? And what is their content? Beloved, listen, even apply these tests to the Christian content that you consume. I want to tell you that not every internet prophet is a non-profit prophet. Some of them have stopped running ministries and they're running media companies instead. Boom. What are their motives? What are their attitudes? And what is their content? How can we cut the chatter? Few thoughts. You doing all right? Few thoughts from 1 Timothy. Number one, consider the source of information. Here's a second thought inspect the fruit of the information. Does it produce chaos or wholesomeness? Inspect the fruit. Paul says, along, along with evaluating the source, look at the outcomes. What, what does it produce? What effect does it have? Here are a few questions we might ask. Does the information promote or diminish faith? The disinformation in Ephesus took people's focus away from Jesus. It floated all kinds of spiritual sounding ideas that diverted people away from the simple truth of his saving grace. Moralism, legalism, asceticism, Gnosticism. It led people down rabbit trails that distracted them from the work of evangelism, from telling others about Jesus. Listen, some of y'all ought to shut off the internet prophets and go invite your neighbor out for coffee and share Jesus with them. I don't know whether Donald Trump is coming back, but I know Jesus is coming back, and we got to be ready. There, I said it. <laughs> Did I mention we have really good coffee and donuts downstairs after service? Listen, the, the disinformation... It caused people to become unwittingly opposed to the central truths of the gospel. Paul says the outcome is apostasy, shipwrecked faith, abandoned faith. Here's another question. Does the information promote or damage personal well-being? I love this. In 1 Timothy, St. Paul calls the gospel healthy teaching. In your translation, it says the sound doctrine. The word is healthy. I want to tell you the gospel is good for your soul. The gospel heals you from anxiety and it brings God's peace to you. It imparts a healthy sense of identity, of self-worth, of security. By the gospel, we understand that we are God's own handiwork and he deeply loves us with an everlasting love. The gospel releases inner joy in our spirit, joy unspeakable and full of glory. Jesus said, my peace, my shalom, I leave with you. That word shalom means nothing is missing and nothing is broken. The wholeness of personhood that Jesus himself possessed when he walked the earth, he has given to us. That means perfect masculinity for men and perfect femininity for women. This disinformation in Ephesus produced precisely the opposite of the healthy gospel. Paul says that it created people who are irreverent, disrespectful, selfish, antisocial, violent, sexually immoral, unjust, and oppressive. Sound familiar, anyone? Closely related is another question. Does the information promote or endanger healthy relationships? Paul said that those spreading the disinformation in Ephesus had a sick 
obsession with controversy. Those who rejected the healthy gospel, the healthy doctrine, became sickly obsessed with quarreling. Have you ever noticed how much people love to argue these days? So I belong to a uh, Facebook group called Greenwich Connections. It was actually started by a friend of mine who lives just down Bedford Road around the corner. Her kids went to school with our kids. And, and the purpose of the group was to help neighbors who are perhaps looking for a plumber or a tailor or looking for, you know, a restaurant recommendation. But I've never seen a group of people that love to fight more than the crowd in Greenwich Connections. Every thread ends up in a fight over Donald Trump. I'm looking for a plumber. You probably need a plumber because Donald Trump and Russian spies have ruined your pipes. <laughs> and it's off to the races we go. And if it's a slow day on Greenwich Connections, someone will drop a post just to stir the pot and get the whole hive going. People love to fight. Beloved, I want to tell you something is not right in America, the milk of human kindness has turned sour in our country. Graciousness and brotherly love and neighborly affection have dissipated. Paul said they would. The outcomes of disinformation are envy and strife and slander and evil suspicions and constant friction. Apparently, Paul was also a member of Greenwich Connections. Another question, does the information promote or destroy common sense? The final outcome of disinformation is corrupted minds robbed of the truth. I love this. In, in one translation of the Bible, in 1 Timothy 6 verse 4, it, it uses the words pompous ignoramuses. For all their learning, they wouldn't recognize the truth if it hit them on the head. You know, 1 Timothy parallels Romans chapter 1 very closely. In Romans chapter 1, Paul describes the downward spiral of human society. And he says the final outcome is that professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Their thinking became futile. Their hearts became dark and their minds depraved. Beloved, I want to encourage you. Look at the outcomes. Look at the ideologies that our leaders and our social institutions have embraced. Education, public health, criminal justice, social justice, economics, environment, even our military for crying out loud. Look at the ideologies that they have embraced and then look at the fruit. Is our society, have you listened to the people running our economy? I had a very dear friend, wonderful, wonderful friend. He's home with the Lord now, but he was on the opposite side of the political spectrum from me. And we used to meet at the IHOP, not the House of Prayer, but the House of Pancakes <laughs> on Central Avenue in Hartsdale. And we were talking about the economy one day and... You know, we, we used to get in such heated discussions that we would literally stop the traffic in the international. Everybody, every table would stop because we were shouting at each other. And he said to me, you just don't understand macroeconomics. I said, all I understand is that if you keep spending more than you make, eventually you're going to go broke. <laughs> Look at the outcomes. Is our country getting better or is our country getting sicker? The Lord said in the prophet Jeremiah, stand at the crossroads, crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. How can we 
cut the chatter, consider the source of information, inspect the fruit of information. Finally, this worship team, you can come help. Practice the four F's. Practice the four F's. In the closing lines of 1 Timothy, Paul gives four F's to help us turn away from godless chatter. The first F is flee. Paul says to Timothy, simply run away. Shut off the source of disinformation. If it's the TV, change the channel. You don't even have to get up to change the channel. I grew up, I was the youngest in my family. I was the channel changer. I had to get up and change the channel. You don't even have to move from your chair. You can just click change the channel. Or here's an idea, shut it off. If it's social media, turn it off. If it's the radio, put on praise and worship instead. I like Air One. They play great music. Jesus said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to go through life maimed than to be thrown whole into hell. Now listen, listen, listen. Jesus did not mean that literally, all right? He didn't literally mean to tear your eye out or physically cut off your hand, but this is what Jesus did mean. Take radical steps to eliminate the influences of sin in your life. The things that pull you away from Christ, the things that pull you away from faith, the things that just corrupt your morals, Jesus said, take radical steps to eliminate them. If Tinder causes you to sin, delete it. If TikTok causes you to sin, delete it. If your iPhone causes you to sin, take it to the bathroom, leave it in the bowl. It's better to go through life without an iPhone than to be thrown into hell holding on to it. Whatever the source of disinformation in your life, whatever's having a negative effect, influence on your thought life with regard to faith get rid of it the second f follow follow paul said to timothy pursue righteousness and godliness faith and love pursue your relationship with christ pursue christ likeness in your character and in your conduct pick up the word of god we shared in our HT Basics class on Wednesdays this last week about the Word of God. And you know, when you, when you first try to start reading the Word of God, it's, it's a challenge. It's a spiritual challenge. It's a spiritual book, and you need help from the Holy Spirit to read it. But it's a little bit like lifting weights. You know, when you first go to the gym and you start using free weights, you know, you, you, you have no control. You're all over the place. But as you keep working it, you those stabilizing muscles get strengthened and your muscle memory starts to kick in and you just get better. You fall in the pocket. It's the same way with reading the Word of God. Don't start in the book of Genesis. It's a great book. We'll get there. But start with Jesus and the Gospels and go that way and gain your sea legs in the Word of God. Grow in the habit of daily prayer. Stay in fellowship with believers. If you haven't gotten plugged into a life group yet this fall, come join us. We have a bunch on Wednesday night, and we have a bunch throughout the week. Be a part of it. Flee, follow. A third F is fight. The word that Paul uses in 1 Timothy 6 doesn't mean combat, but it rather means an athletic contest like a marathon it means to push through the agony literally what it says in greek is agonize the agony you know somewhere around the 20 mile mark in a marathon runners hit the wall their muscles and their organs become depleted of carbohydrate energy and it signals to the brain we're done here it takes both mental and physical toughness to push through the wall it can be pushed through in the same way in the Christian life we sometimes hit the wall when we're physically or mentally tired 
when we're discouraged, when we're in pain, when we're disappointed with God over something that has happened or disappointed with the church or with other believers when we're alone, sometimes when we're just overwhelmed, and just like a runner in mile 23 of a marathon, those are the times that we need to dig in and fight the fight. We need to flee and we need to follow harder than we ever have before. Finally, this, the last F, fasten on to eternal life. Timothy, don't you quit. Don't you give up. You keep on fleeing. You keep on following. You keep on fighting through the pain all the way to the end until you obtain the prize of eternal life. Timothy, turn away from godless chatter. Turn, turn away from opposing ideas that are mislabeled as knowledge, as science. Some have professed these and in so doing have wandered away from the faith. Those final words from Paul come from the world of archery. Wandered away. It means they've missed the bullseye. The arrow veers off and it misses the mark. Beloved, I want to tell you the hope of the Christian life is eternal life. Fellowship with Christ forever. And any philosophy of life, any moral or religious philosophy that doesn't end with eternity in heaven with Christ is frivolous. Don't miss the mark of heaven. Cut the chatter. Would you stand and give Jesus a great big praise in this place today? Oh, come on, don't give him a wimpy little praise. Let's give him a great big praise in this place today. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, lift up your hands, lift up your faces, lift up your voices. Come on, let's worship him one more time. Give the Lord a good praise, would you? Thank you, Lord. We're going we're gonna to pray together in just a moment. I want to let you know that we have a prayer room. It's across the foyer in that direction. If anybody would like personal prayer after the service, you can slip in there. Pastor Ruth and our friends will meet you. We do have really good coffee and donuts downstairs. Go down for a little fellowship. We have something at the door to give you. I, I wasn't brave enough to give this out at the beginning, at the beginning of the service. It's a little chatter. It's a little wind-up chatter teeth. So I wasn't brave enough to give it out on your way in because I was afraid of what would happen while I was trying to preach. But you can take one of these on your way out 
and uh, maybe maybe set it by your computer maybe set it on your desk or wherever it is that you take in content maybe keep this by you as just a little reminder to cut the chatter i want to pray a prayer with you just before we go last week we ended with david's prayer i pray this every day as part of my prayer life and we prayed it together and i want to invite you to pray it again with us it says search me oh god test my know my heart search me oh god test my thoughts and examine my ways see if there be any wicked thing in me and lead me in the path of everlasting would you would you pray that prayer with me today i want to invite you if you're willing would you put your put your hand over your heart let's just let's just pray it together search me oh god and know my heart search me oh god and test my thoughts search me oh god examine my ways see if there be any wicked thing in me and lead me in the path of everlasting life let me just pray for you before you go father i thank you for the people that you love so much lord jesus he is the source he is the ultimate truth he is the source of all truth and the message that Jesus says over and over again is God loves you, 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 God loves you. Father, I, I, I pray that we would be rooted and grounded in the truth. I pray that we would be the foundation and pillar of the truth. Father, I, I pray that you would give your people wise and discerning hearts. Lord, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the Holy One is understanding and good judgment. Father, I pray that as we evaluate the source of the information coming at us, that, Lord, you would help us by the gifts of the Holy Spirit to distinguish the motives, the content, the attitudes. God, I pray as we inspect the fruit of information, Lord, you would help us to discern what is wholesome and healthy and good lord and what promotes corruption and chaos father i pray that we would flee godless chatter i pray that we'd follow hard after christ father i pray for everyone who is facing the wall right now lord discouragement disappointment exhaustion father i pray that we would agonize the good agony i pray that we'd push through the wall holding on to you Father, I pray that we would take hold of the prize, eternity in heaven with Jesus. Lord, bless your people. Bless them this week when they lay down. Bless them when they wake up again. Bless them when they leave for work and bless them when they come home again. Bless them in the city. Bless them in the country. Lord, bless all the work of their hands. Let everything they touch prosper. Bless them in all of their provisions. Lord, economies, uh, 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 Lord, um, a recession and, and uh, Lord, escalating inflation, it's not a problem for you, Lord. Father, let us be blessed in our provisions. Father, I pray that you would keep us until we come together again. And everybody said, amen and amen. God bless you, everybody. God be with you. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.